Oh, greetings, friend. Uh, pardon me? You wish to rob me? <sighs> what makes you think you can get away with that? Oh, it's, it's because all I carry is a shield, huh? Well, what you don't know is that it hides my gun. Yes, yes, fine, you got me, it's just a toy. But the real purpose was simply to distract you so I can draw my real gun. So how about you pay up now? Enough talk, villain. Let's fight. What's that you say? This is not fighting? Well, you're right. I was just trying to pose to intimidate you and dissuade you from attacking me because I don't actually know how to use this. So, uh, see ya. All right, let's talk some more about the topic that some folks seem to find supremely offensive. Realism in movie and video game fights. Um, now, there are certain aesthetic and artistic rules, and animators have explained that to me before on videos where I talked about these topics, and they make good points. You know, from an artistic point of view, you have very different considerations compared to fighting that's informed by historical martial arts. Now, traditionally, you have certain methods designed to emphasize movements, make them clearer for the audience to see, and also to make them look more impressive. You know, the heroes are supposed to look epic. The anti-heroes and villains are supposed to look badass. And of course, that's part of the appeal. We want that. You know, we as the general broad audience. There's of course a number of different subgenres of fantasy, and there's also the grittier, more realism-based type of fantasy, as well as the much more over the top, you know, um, anime schoolgirls fighting giant monsters sort of thing. So what you have, for example, is anticipation in the animation and, and choreography. In a fight, you don't want to telegraph what you're doing, but for the audience, it may be good to see what's going on in advance. So you would often see the sort of retraction and then strike. This is not supposed to be a criticism of video game or movie characters or fight scenes in general. They are designed the way they are for a reason, to you know, present the action in a certain way, to get a certain reaction from the audience, etc., etc. But I find it amusing to think about how epically these epic characters would fail if they acted the way they do in those fantasy scenarios in a real life fight. And uh, in a lot of the time, it would not go terribly well. So, to give you an example, uh, imagine you were to fight me in a one-on-one -on -one duel. Uh, what do you think would be easier for you to defend against if you don't have any prior martial arts experience, or at least with swords? This? Or this? This? Or this? So you get the idea. In real historical sword fighting, at least in case of one-on-one -on -one duels, subtlety is crucial. You don't want to let the opponent know well in advance what you're about to do. And spinning, twirling, and elaborate jumping attacks do exactly that. They let the opponent know what's coming. Now, sometimes people object by pointing to MMA fights where you see a spinning back fist or, or a spinning kick leading to a knockout. But it's not like it's terribly common there. It's not bread and butter techniques exactly. But even if it was more common, you have to keep in mind how different unarmed fighting is to fighting with a sword. You know, anything that has a certain amount of reach. So just to try to illustrate that, I'm not an MMA fighter. I haven't trained unarmed martial arts extensively, so this is not going to be super fast and elegant or anything. But if we were at unarmed fighting range and I try to throw a spinning back fist. You know, again, keep in mind, this could be a lot faster. Now compare that to being at sword distance and doing this. This is going to take so much longer and be so much easier to spot. And you can punish that. Because essentially, while I'm spinning, all you have to do 
is step forward and thrust, basically. Now, it can be done properly. I've seen some good examples from Chinese swordsmanship. For example, you can ask my friend Sword Sage about that on YouTube. Um, so it's usually combined with lateral movement, you know, getting around the opponent and getting a better angle. And then you may get away with that, as opposed to just spinning in front of somebody. If you, you know, step off to the side and do something, that may actually work. Also against multiple opponents, that's a different story. There are, for example, techniques with the Iberian Montante, which is a large two-handed sword, which involve a lot of wide sweeping cuts and spinning around to meet multiple opponents. Like, for example, if I ha have an opponent here and then there's somebody behind me, oh, here's another person, oh, no, I can just keep moving around like this and make sure I cover everything I need to. How does that work? Well, you have to imagine a fairly large open area with multiple opponents coming in from a distance. So you can prepare and you can basically create this danger zone. Where you just threaten everybody around you and they don't want to move in because they know that they are so far away that it takes them enough time that even with a large two-handed sword, by the time they're in, you're probably, you've probably returned on the backswing and can strike them then. And if your sword is way larger and heavier than theirs, then they're not going to be able to parry that effectively. So it's, it's very, very dangerous to enter that you know, circle of death, if you will. But generally what you want is eliminate as much unnecessary movement as possible. So as opposed to raising up your first, and then throwing the cut, it's more effective for me to just throw the cut directly from the shoulder. Or, let's say from here, as opposed to doing this number, I would just cut directly from the guard. So you cut from one guard to the other to make it as efficient as possible. So what's the difference between a committed attack and an overswing? Uh, so I've seen a few comments here and there where people ask, isn't, isn't that overswinging? What are you doing there? And um, so to, to try to illustrate the difference, uh, a committed attack is one that has enough follow through to produce an effective clean cut. So if I go from, from left wrath guard and throw a cut here, this is follow through. So. I want to accelerate the blade before it makes contact. Then it, come, it goes through and I pull it through to make sure that I really slice through as much of, of the target as I can. Now, I, what I don't want to do, and what would be an overswing, would be this. So you see the blade is now all the way over here where it's not doing anything to protect me. I've even turned my body away from the opponent I'm, I even look away from the opponent, that's an overswing. And it also throws me off balance. So again, this is a committed attack. This is an overswing. To a lot of viewers, this will look more powerful than this. Even though the second one is actually more powerful because I'm putting more of my body weight into it. The idea is, instead of just swinging with my arms, I power the cut with my core muscles. So hips, legs, I step into it, boom. So I'm driving the cut with my entire body. That is actually way more powerful. It's just a little more subtle. Now, of course, in multiplayer games, you can't go too far because minimizing movement means it gets harder and harder to respond to it in time. Thank you. The player needs to have enough time to see what's happening, press the button, and trigger the animation. So because it's more indirect, because there's a controller between your body and that body, it takes a little bit longer than it would in real life. In real life, you just know, okay, use, use arms and body. Now, of course, you have to uh, develop muscle memory through training and all of that. But so you need a bit more time in a game to get it right. So you need to see where that's coming from. You can't just expect a player to get it if, boom, this, this is all that happens. You have to get the, here I come, get ready. It's already difficult enough. So 
there, there's only so far you can go with that. In single player games, it's generally easier. Kingdom Come Deliverance is a good example, which has fantastic animations, highly accurate, based on real historical techniques. Basically, the way they fight in the game is probably about as close as you can get to real life, while still looking good, which is a good argument for the fact that realism doesn't have to always fall under the table completely. If the game is right, you know, in a certain setting, it can actually benefit from realism and it can look great, in fact. But, you know, it's all, of course, personal preference. It's all about what kind of game are we talking about, what genre, etc., etc. There's so many things about it, but I just want to ramble on a little bit and, and, and give you some visual examples to, to illustrate that, to see the difference between you know, fantasy fighting and more reality-based fighting. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. If you're interested in buying nice shinies to mess around with, there's a link to Cult of Athena down below, which was my favorite store for buying swords, armor, etc. And there's also a link to my Patreon page and a few other things, so check that out. Um, yeah, thanks for watching. Hope you liked it. See you next time.